Hey, 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 people of God, Dr. DJ Robinson here at drdjrobinson.com. I want to thank you for tuning in to this broadcast and let you know that if you would like more details about live presentations, lectures, seminars, and ministry events, you can please follow me at drdjrobinson.com forward slash event for more details. I hope that this broadcast helps someone today. May God bless you. Let's get into it. J. Robinson, and um, um, we are here on our Tuesday night Bible study with the Body of Christ Perfecting Church. Um, I want to give a thanks and honor to Pastor Anthony Council, who um, has provided this platform for us this evening, Lady Tanya Council, also founder James Smith. And all of the beautiful and wonderful people who are on the line this evening, welcome to the Tuesday night teaching. Uh, tonight I'll be your facilitator, and um, I hope that everyone is doing well. Let's go ahead and pray at this point. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this day, for this is the day that you have made. Your word says that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We command our souls to make their boast in the Lord so that it the humble shall hear thereof and it shall make them glad. I'm inviting each and every one of you to magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together because we know that whenever we call upon the name of the Lord, that he hears us in our distress and delivers us from each and every one of our fears. So therefore, Lord, we ask that you would grant us the serenity to accept the things that we cannot change. Give us the courage to change the things that we can and the wisdom to know the difference. We ask, dear God, that you would teach us to pray as you taught your disciples to pray by saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Tonight we are talking about boundaries and work. And I'd like to start this uh, broadcast or the, the Bible study by making a confession that my name is Dr. DJ Robinson and I am a workaholic. <laughs> I am a workaholic. And that is my confession this evening. Uh, and I'm hoping to be able that we can share some tips and some things that we learned from this reading tonight to uh, curb our workaholism and establish some boundaries. Uh, we It is evident that we live in a day and a time, uh, and I'll speak for this point from the perspective of a black woman, single mother, uh, living in New York State. I don't know how it is in other places, but I do know that in New York State, which is one of the highest taxed, states in the country um that the pressure and the uh to maintain especially during a time of inflation especially during a time of single parenting when that has been on the rise for quite some time in our current cultural climate uh workaholism and burnout is on an all-time high and we must have the word of god and we must use the boundaries that God gives us so that we do not um, what it says, get weary in our well-doing um, if we learn to pace ourselves. So in this particular uh, chapter 11, which begins on page 195 in our book that we are studying, Boundaries, When to Say Yes, How to Say No, 
to Take Control of Your Life by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. Uh, in this particular chapter, uh, the, uh, the author is addressing work. And so I'm going to read the first couple of pages and then we'll go through and pull out certain bullet points from the reading. He says that in Sunday school, we were studying Adam and Eve and the fall. And I learned that the fall was the beginning of everything, quote unquote, bad. That day I went home and said to my mother, I don't like Adam and Eve. If it weren't for them, I would not have to clean up my room. Um, <laughs> work at age eight was not fun because uh, it wasn't fun because it was bad. And because it was bad, it was Adam's fault. And a simple theological theory for a youngster was that, you know, um, it was, you know, that's bad because it's work and we wouldn't have to work if Adam didn't fall. And so that's what they would call a youthful heresy. Uh, work exists, but the thing that we have to realize is that work existed before the fall. It was always a part of God's plan for humanity and he planned for people to do two things. They would subdue and they would rule right? So he says, subdue the earth, rule it, right? You will rule over the things and be, let's put in that being a good steward over that which God has placed in your care. And so that does take work. And if we haven't realized that throughout, you know, understanding how we must be responsible to people, but not necessarily responsible for people, understanding how, you know, we have to be good stewards over that which God has entrusted to us, being impeccable with our words, being incremental with our time, uh, being intentional about our space and immortalizing our energy. When we look at these types of things, we want to make sure that um, we are being very good stewards over that which God has given. So uh, work existed before the fall. And so he planned for us to be able to do these two things and that we would bring the earth under our domain and that we would manage it. And that is actual work um, because it was in the Garden of Eden, which was a paradise. Our difficulties with work came after the fall. So the work was not hard. When you're working under God's blessing, when you're working under God's care, when you're working under God's permissive will, it does not feel like it is burdensome work, but it is still work in general. So therefore God said to Adam, cursed is the ground because of you. And now because you've fallen and here it is, we're going to get into this reading. You've, you've passed on what was your responsibility into blaming someone else for your own shortcoming. Now you will have painful toil and you will eat the food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field and by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground since from it you were taken for dust you are and dust you will return. This for me resonates with God speaking, not just to Adam as the spirit Adam is, but Adam as the flesh. And so because it was that flesh mentality that caused Adam to fight into that apple of the knowledge of tree, the fruit of the knowledge of tree of good and evil. That is what caused his eyes to be open and what caused him to fall from understanding work as being something paradise to now something being a uh, sweat and painful toil or burden. So other aspects of the fall also affect our work. The first is the tendency of disownership. And that's the first sin that we can commit or have committed onto us. Disownership. We talked in earlier chapters about this boundary problems of not taking responsibility for what is ours, not being good stewards over that which has been entrusted to us. And this started in the garden when Adam and Eve tried to pass the blame and I think we talked about this a little bit last week to another for their original act of disobedience to God. And that's the sin. The sin is disobedience to God and disobedience to God causes us to, uh, to endure trauma, right? Adam blamed Eve 
Eve blamed the serpent. They were disowning their responsibilities and blaming each other. And so their theme was to get the attention off of me, get it off, get the attention off of me. I don't want to be responsible for this. I need to get the attention off of me. This tendency to blame another is a key work problem because we try to make other people be responsible for that which has been entrusted to us. Again, going back to what we talked about before with reaping and sowing, only you can reap what you have sown. You cannot pass the blame or the buck to someone else. Each one, we can bear one another's burdens, but each one has to carry their own load and each one of us has to work out our own soul's salvation. All right. So on page 196, it says the fall also divided love from work. Now, before the fall, Adam was connected to the love of God. And from that love state, he worked. After the fall, he was not motivated out of perfect love, but he had to work as a part of the fallen world's curse and the law. So the love motivated a want to work. But when that became uh, law motivated, it becomes you have to or you should work. Okay, so it changes the perspective that we see when it's motivated out of love, not out of fear, not out of compulsion, not out of obligation. But when it's something that is God given and we want to work because we want to be good stewards over that which has been entrusted to us, then we have that it comes from a place that is motivated from a perfect love. And of course, perfect love casts out fear. But when you're just working and doing things because you fear losing your job or losing your status or losing your place, or uh, when you have laws or, you know, some things that st- that actually dictate how, when, and why you should work, now it becomes obligation. And these are some very heavy words that we can use or heavy vocabulary that we can use that will uh, cause us to be able to see these things differently. Now, Paul tells us laws should, right? The, The should of the law increases our wish to rebel. It makes us angry at what we should be doing, right? And should, I've learned, is a judgment word. You should do this. You should do that. You should do. And it feels so burdensome and it becomes more of a, um, of a obligation than I, you want to do something. And so, um, it makes us angry at what we should be doing. Now, uh, the author uses Romans chapter five, uses Romans chapter four, Romans chapter seven. So all inside of those verses, you'll start to see where, Um, the, where Paul talks about the laws that are put on us. And aside from the law, we would, you know, not know what was good. Right. And so it wasn't until he understood what the law actually was that he found out that he was actually sinning. Right. And so all of this adds up to the human race being unable to take responsibility and work effectively by owning its own behaviors owning its own talents and owning up to our choices. And so no wonder we have problems with the word work, W-O-R-K, or with work, all right? So in this chapter and in tonight's Bible study, we want to look at how boundaries can help resolve many work-related problems, as well as they can help us to be happier and have more uh, fulfillment in the work that we actually do. So when you talk about work and we talk about character development, we have to also look at the way that Christians, the worldview of Christianity has has a very warped way of looking at work. Sometimes we tend to think of work as a secular uh, vocation, unless it's work in quote unquote ministry, right? So when we look at it that way, oh, unless it's ministry, you know, it's work. No, all of it is work. All of it. Right. So that view of saying, unless it's ministry, um, it distorts the biblical view of what God wants us to see. 
all of us, not only ministry professionals, but each and every one of us have gifts. We have talents that we contribute, not just to ministry, but to all humanity, right? And so here, if you haven't underlined it, I put here a star on page 196. We all have a vocation, a calling into service. Who, wherever we work, whatever we do, we are to do it, according to Colossians 3 and 23, for the Lord, as unto the Lord. So no matter where we are, since we belong to God, since we have faith in God, since we believe God's word, no matter what we're doing, there's no differential between our secular work and our ministry. It's all ministry. It's all work for the Lord. How we perceive and how we do things at our jobs, it's all work for the Lord. Um, Jesus used parables about work to teach us how to grow spiritually. And a lot of those parables dealt with money, right? It dealt with completing tasks. It dealt with faithful stewardship over our jobs, honest emotional dealings at work. And so they all teach character development in the context of relating to God and others. And it teaches us a work ethic that is based on love under God. Now, let me just pause here because we talked about love and how love, loving other people is to set boundaries. You have to love your no and your boundaries just as much as you love other people's boundaries. So we're going to get into some of this. So we have to remember that work, quote unquote, is a spiritual activity. And in our work, we are made in the image of God, who is himself a worker. God worked, the first, he worked six days and he rested on the seventh. God has work boundaries, right? And so he's a worker. He's a manager, a creator, a developer, a steward, a healer. These are all works that God does on our behalf in a spiritual realm. So we should not look at work as only being physical. It is also psychological. It is also emotional. It is spiritual. It is all of the above. And so when it gives me different or a new insight to where when God said to Adam that now by the sweat of your brow, you will work, that means not only in the physical sense, but in the emotional sense, you're going to be challenged and you're going to have to do the work. You're going to be a challenge in the psychological sense. You're going to be challenged morally. You're going to be challenged uh, uh, emotionally. You're going to be challenged in so many different aspects of you. And you're going to have to do the work until the day that you die. Hey, God, that is the task at this point. For us as believers of God, and he says, if you believe in my word, he says, if you take my yoke upon you and learn of me, then you will find that my yoke, the work you do with me is easy and the burden is light. It's not as burdensome, hiya, when you do it with the will and according to the purposes and the plans of God. When you believe in God's word and you take the principles of God and you establish those boundaries and you realize that you are not responsible for other people's work, but you're responsible to do that with your hand found to do and to do it heartedly as unto God, which is your reasonable service. When you do your reasonable service to God, that yoke becomes, that work becomes easy and the burden is lifted, okay? Your perspective changes on it, all right? So to be a Christian or to be a believer of God's word is to be a co-laborer with God in the community of humanity, which means not just our local community, but in the fact that we are human, Regardless of how much melanin is in our skin, regardless of whether our hair is curly or straight or gender, it doesn't matter. It's the community of humanity. And by giving to others what we're, um, to, by giving to others, we find our true fulfillment. But when we're able to become co-laborers with one another, we can find true fulfillment. And as I remind you, there are two things that we need as humanity. We need authenticity and we need connection. 
right? We need authenticity and we need connection. And so when we get that fulfillment, we reach that self-actualization, which gives us our purpose. It gives us our authenticity. And then God brings connection through that means. The New Testament, it teaches us, I'm on page 197, that work offers more than temporal fulfillment and rewards on earth. Work is the place to develop our character in preparation for the work that we will do forever, which is in eternity. With that in mind, we have to look at how setting boundaries in the workplace and the church place can help us grow spiritually. So a lot of times we get problems in the workplace. And so a lack of boundaries is what creates those problems. And so um, we have to take, if people were to take responsibility for their own work, set clear limits, then most of the problems um, that when we get confused and stuff like that would not exist. And so when we apply boundaries to our lives and become good stewards over that which God has given us, our time, our words, our energy, our space, when we become better stewards over those elements, and we're just using those four for now, uh, we can actually have better uh, development, we'll have better functionality, we'll have better purpose, we will have find our loads are lightened and lifted. We'll find freedom in those areas because we're operating now within the ramifications or within the realm that God has set for us. So the first problem is that we can get saddled with another person's responsibility. And I love this story. This story is about um, Hannah and Jack. And so Hannah and Jack Everyone thinks that Hannah and Jack work very well together. And so Hannah loves her job at first. But when she starts finding out that really what's happening is she's doing the majority of the work. So right near the bottom of that page, Jack had been asking Hannah to pick up this for me while you're out. Bring this box of materials to the workshop. Slowly, Jack was shifting his responsibilities onto Hannah. Now, this happens not only in the workplace, it can happen in relationships. If we want to broaden that out, it can happen within our uh, parent-child relationships. It can happen in our churches where people will slowly shift their responsibilities over to you. Now, listen to this. You have to stop doing Jack's work, Linda told Hannah, and just do your own work and don't worry about him. But see, Here's the thing, when we are believers in Christ and we're introduced to certain church cultures or certain cultures in ministry, we feel that we get stuck into this Messiah trap, we get stuff stuck into the savior complex, and it could be from our own traumas of our childhood. And so Hannah asks, well, what if things go wrong? What if things go wrong? Linda shrugged. She says, then they'll blame Jack. It's not your responsibility. And this is where boundaries really come in. And this is where emotional boundaries come in. Because a lot of times I, and I'll be transparent for myself, would think that everything was going to go wrong if I did not intervene. And then sometime it would still go wrong. And because I intervened, I shared in a guilt of something that was never my responsibility in the first place, right? And so then he says, well, she's, um, uh, Hannah says, Jack will be angry with me for not helping. And Linda says to her, let him, his anger can't hurt you as much as his poor work habits can. Right. And so we have to remember, we talked about hurt and harm, right? Uh, Hannah was starting to be harmed by Jack's irresponsibility. And so it can't hurt to set these limits on people. It's they're going to get angry, but remember what our golden rule is. We are not responsible for how people feel about our boundaries. Okay? So Hannah began to set limits on Jack. I'm on page 198. She told him, I will not have time to bring the materials for you this week when Jack would run out of time of doing things himself. You know, he would try to pass that blame and Hannah would just say, I'm sorry that you didn't do this before now. You know, 
this is what is going to have to get Jack to put some fire under himself and start to get the tasks done. And so, you know, uh, maybe next time you'll plan better, but I got to let you know, Jack, that's not my job right? And maybe you might have to call some people, Jack. They won't know what you're really saying. Sometimes you have to say it for yourself. Like, that's not my job, Jack, you know? <laughs> and so some trainers um, are angry, uh, you know, that the equipment, some some of the trainers were angry that their equipment was not set up. The customer was angry that there was no food provided um, before the break, but the boss tracked down the problem to the person who was responsible. That's the same thing that God will do with us. Jack, Jack was responsible and he, the boss told him shape up or he had to find another job. And in the end, Hannah began to feel rewarded for her work again. Now, I also want to apply this principle to ministry. Sometimes we can overburden ourselves with other people's responsibilities. This is why it's important for us to have clear conversations about what is my responsibility and what is not. What am I responsible to? What am I responsible for? And what is what I am not? Okay. And so, um, Let's find the place here. And so he told him, uh, and so Hannah began to like work again. Jack began to get more responsible. Here it is. Both of them are growing. And all because Hannah set boundaries and she stuck to them. That's the other thing that we have to remind ourselves of. Consistency. So here's a tip on page 198 about the fourth paragraph down. It says, if you are being saddled with another person's responsibility and you're starting to feel resentful, you may need to take responsibility, here it is, for your feelings and realize that your unhappiness is not your co-worker's fault. It's your own. Right? In this, as in any other boundary conflict, you must first take responsibility for yourself. Okay. That's how anger, resentment, those are triggers to let us know that there's an area in our life spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, even physically that is not built up. And so we have to take heed to that and take responsibility for rebuilding or allowing God to set the foundation and building in that area. Okay. Uh, then you must act responsible responsibly to your co-worker. Go to your worker, explain the situation. And all of this is listed in Matthew chapter, uh, I believe it was 18. You go to them, you tell them the problem. You know, you, you if they don't want to listen, you take another person with you. You know, if they still don't want to listen, then you tell it to the boss or whoever's in charge. And then you wash your hands of the whole thing, right? So um, you don't get... Uh, so it says when, when someone asks you or when the person asks you to do something that is not your responsibility, say no and refuse to do whatever it is that he or she wants you to do. And if they get angry with you for saying no, be firm about your boundaries and empathize. I understand that you're angry, but I'm still not doing it because, you know, and that's just, <laughs> that's just, that's just real. You're going to have to find somebody else who will. And it says, don't get angry back. To fight anger with anger is to get hooked into a game, a cycle, and you don't want to get that. Keep your emotional distance and say, I'm sorry that this upsets you, but that is your job and that is not my responsibility, right? And I hope you get it worked out. I hope you figure it out. Now, if people continue to argue with you, right, you're done. Just be done with it. Uh, they can come find you when they're ready to talk about something else. It's important to be able to establish these healthy boundaries. Don't fall into the trap of justifying why you can't do it. And that's what I would do. I would start, oh, explaining myself. And I would explain myself right into ending up doing the work. And then I would be resentful. I'd be burnt out. I'd be tired and I didn't want to do it. And it just turned into a whole thing. And so it's very important that we don't slip into um, justifying why we can and why we can't do something else for somebody, because then we'll start slipping into that thinking that they can help you. You ever had somebody to try to help you figure out how you can do something for them? 
you know, well, it won't take you that long. How do you know it won't take, how long it's going to take me? You know, you got, <laughs> we really have to get into a place where we stop explaining stuff. So on that last sentence on page 198, if you have not underlined it, underline it now. It says, you owe no one an explanation about why you will not do something that is not your responsibility.